Well, good morning, everyone. And welcome to God's house on this very first Sunday of our Advent season. And you can tell that our sanctuary has had a bit of a makeover here in anticipation of the coming of our Lord. And that's what Advent means. It's Latin for Adventus, meaning coming. And yes, we're waiting on two different levels, waiting for the celebration of our Lord's uh, coming the first time at Christmas time, and uh, also waiting on him to come again, because we have that promise that that's exactly what he'll do at the end of time. So as we're thinking about that today, we're going to focus on our epistle lesson, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians this morning. And we'll find there in that letter, uh, in his greeting, that Paul actually compliments the Corinthian congregation by saying that they didn't lack any spiritual gift. Now, they were lacking in many ways, but not in spiritual gifts. And that really is something that any congregation would be happy to hear and to experience. So let it be our constant uh, prayer that God would bless us in that same way as we remember uh, and will remember in today's sermon that God is always faithful and he'll do what he promises to do for us, his sheep, and for the church worldwide. So we'll focus on that in just a little bit with uh, today's sermon. Uh, We're using our abbreviated version of uh, Rite 2, our order of services on page 60 of your hymnal, But we'll begin with our opening hymn, Hymn 90, Hymn 90. I was telling Linda just a moment ago, um, and I'm going to just mention it because by the end of the the service today, I'll forget. But um, 
I put the altar flowers on the pulpit, and in your bulletin, you may see that the altar flowers were given uh, in honor. Uh, but I put them over there because we're kind of full on the altar, plus, I don't know if you know this, kind of a revelation maybe for some, I'm short. <laughs> So if it was either here or there, I couldn't see certain segments. So that's why I put it over there, Linda. Okay. And there I'm standing higher when Rick's not moved the little box thing that we have there for him. All right. Well, with that said, then let us now turn to page 60 in your hymnal as we continue with the invocation. Page 60. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, you can see here that we have our Advent wreath now on the altar. That coincides with it being uh, the season of Advent. And we have writ, uh, lit excuse me, the uh, first candle, which traditionally is known as the candle of hope. And with Christians around the world, we use this light to help prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior as well. So may we receive God's light through faith in Christ as we hear these words from the prophet Isaiah. Taken from Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of darkness on them. The light has shined. And so we pray. Lord, as we look forward to the birth of Jesus, grant that the light of your love for us will help us to let your light living in us shine in and on the lives of those around us. Prepare our hearts for the joy and the gladness of your coming again, because you, Jesus, are our true hope. In your name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Let us now turn to hymn 153, and you'll note there that we're singing verses 1 and 7. Let us confess then, our, or continue with our confession of sin on page 60 of your hymnal. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. <laughs> Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are, by nature, sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, most merciful God, you have given your only begotten Son to die for us. Have mercy upon us, and for his sake, grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace, we may come to everlasting life. 
Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given His only begotten Son to die for us and for His sake forgives us all our sins. To all who believe on His name, He gives power to become the children of God and has promised them His Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. We continue with the Gloria Patri on page 62. During the season of Advent, the Gloria in Excelsis is omitted, so let us now turn to page 66 as we continue with the salutation and prayer. The Lord be with you. And we pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come. Protect us by your strength and save us from the threatening dangers of our sins. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We now continue our worship service as we focus on the written Word of God. And you'll find our scripture lessons today printed on the last page and then on the back page of your bulletin. And our Old Testament lesson for today comes to us from the book of Isaiah, from selected verses found there in chapters 63 and 64, as Isaiah cries out to the Lord to come to his wayward people and to restore his place as their God and their Redeemer. So we begin there in chapter 63 with verse 16. You, Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer, from of old is your name. Why, Lord, do you make us wander from your ways and harden our hearts so we do not revere you? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes that are your inheritance. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down, and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us, and you have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. This is the word of our Lord. And our epistle lesson is taken from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, as I was mentioning earlier, where we find Paul encouraging us with the promise that God will keep us in his grace as we wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. And Jesus will be revealed, by the way, on the last day when he returns in glory. Now this, as I mentioned, will serve as the text for our sermon today, and so it will be read 
at that time. Today's gospel lesson comes to us from Mark's gospel, chapter 13, there on the back of your bulletin, where we see Jesus urging his followers to be on guard and to be alert. No one knows when the day of the, of the Lord or the day of judgment will take place. The only thing we really do know for sure is that the day is coming and that today is actually one day closer than we were yesterday. So we begin reading with verse 32 as I invite you to rise for the gospel reading. Jesus says, About that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. When I, what I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. This is the gospel of our risen Lord. Let us now confess our Christian faith as expressed in the words of the Nicene Creed. You'll find that on page 69 of your hymnal. Page 69. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we continue now with our sermon hymn, Hymn 253.
Peace be to all of you and grace from God, our Heavenly Father, and from His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So on this first Sunday in Advent, we, as I mentioned before, turn to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, and we're going to focus on those seven verses. So as I prepare to read them, I also ask you to rise. So this is what Paul writes. He says, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thus our text, and we pray. Lord Jesus, you have called upon your people to always be on guard and to be alert, because no one knows when the day of judgment will take place. Help each of us to stand firm in our faith and to always be ready for your return. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, dear friends in Jesus, I want to start this morning by asking you to think about this. When was the first time that you can remember that you failed someone. Now I know that's not a happy thought or question, but I would be willing to bet that that's a question that every one of us can relate to. Maybe it was the first time that you forgot an appointment, or you forgot to complete a task, or maybe an assignment. Maybe it was the first time that you had a real argument with your spouse and you lost control of your temper or your tongue. Maybe it was the first time that you were late for work or the first time that you forgot a birthday or an anniversary. I think we could all easily add our own examples to that list, could we not? And I will clearly admit that it's not a good feeling to know that someone else was depending on us to act and to be one way, and we weren't. Sadly, that's one of the lessons that we have to learn pretty quickly as human beings. Other people are going to let us down, just as we have let others down. Now, the difficulty for us, though, is that when we have become so jaded with and and so used, used to, I should say, to failings, the failings of others, well, then we begin to project that onto God himself, thinking that maybe he also has frailties or bad feelings. As Paul greets his people here in the city of Corinth, he reminds them that even though they have failed on several levels, God never fails. Instead, Paul instructs them that God is faithful as he enriches us with Christ's blessings and then he strengthens us as we await Christ's return. Actually, when you examine the situation going on here at the church in Corinth, there is a whole lot of failings going on. The congregation was failing to observe the sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Failing to respect the Lord's Supper. And failing to love and honor each other as God's children. And this is made clear from the amount of correcting that Paul has to do throughout this letter. And if we think about it, it's it's easy to imagine this congregation as being discouraged and deflated. 
as sin seemed to be invading every aspect of their lives. And godliness in Christ seemed far, far away. Perhaps surprisingly, though, Paul doesn't start out by calling them a bunch of lousy, worthless Christians. Instead, he reminds them that even when they haven't been faithful, hello, guilty, that doesn't mean that God stopped being faithful. In particular, Paul points them to God's faithfulness in giving them the blessings that they had already seen enriched with through their faith in Christ Jesus. Those blessings and those gifts were already there. Then Paul goes on to define them as people who have received God's grace and as people capable of declaring that divine grace to others. And so Paul encourages them with the spiritual gifts that they've already received. So many, in fact, that he mentions they're not lacking a single one. And that's why he points them back to the testimony of the gospel, the forgiveness that they received through the completed work of the perfect Savior. And that being the source of all the blessings that they were currently enjoying. Now, understand that it can be very easy for any Christian congregation to forget about the gifts we've already received in Christ. Because any Christian congregation is going to be made up of sinful people. And as such, maybe we get too focused on the numbers or the lack of visitors that we see in our worship from week to week. Maybe we get discouraged by the notices there in the bulletin about budget shortfalls. Maybe we are tempted to complain when we see the same small group of volunteers who show up time after time for each of our church activities. Now, to be clear, these all may be problems that a congregation needs to address. But to be even more clear, these problems do not define who we are in Christ. Nor do they change the blessings that Christ has already showered us with. And if we are tempted to be discouraged with our own congregation or frustrated with the sinful natures and the tendencies of people who are part of our fellowship, we can do nothing better than to take to heart what Paul teaches us today, and that is God is faithful. And so, what does that mean? Well, every sinner that we find right here, we also find a person whose heart has been transformed by the gospel of Jesus. For every shortfall and shortcoming we find here, we also find a generous God who has provided for our needs, the needs of this congregation, for decades upon decades. And for every perceived lack of membership or the lack of participation, we find a God who is still working in the hearts of his people, training them and molding them to be more like him. We can say, right along with the Apostle Paul, that our own congregation has been enriched in every way and that we don't lack any spiritual gifts either as we too eagerly wait for our Lord's return. God is faithful. And he has been faithful to our own congregation by constantly and continually enriching us with Christ's blessings and keeping us anchored in the word of God. Now, perhaps part of Paul's thinking here 
is to remind the Corinthian congregations that they are, in fact, way more blessed than they realize. And see, this is a valid thought since sinful people do have a tendency to focus on the negative and to dismiss past blessings, no matter how vital or significant those blessings were at the time. However, Paul doesn't only point us back to our prior blessings, but he also reminds us of the blessings that we're receiving right now. And even greater blessings awaiting each of us in the future as we continue our daily walk with Christ. A true walk of faith. We see this especially in verse 8 of our text. He will also keep you strong to the very end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a message that we all need to hear and to hear it on a regular basis. Because how often do we feel weak and straying? Because our sinful natures, along with this evil world that surrounds us, ends up distracting us with things of no real value. How often do we feel confused Maybe even alone because of those same reasons. And how often do we feel isolated from God and separated from His grace because this world around us is full of trouble and despair and brings those very things right into our lives? Well, I want you to notice what I was repeating there. How often do we feel We feel, we feel, and yet feelings are so fickle, are they not? They can be affected by so many things, including the anchovy pizza you had the night before. So how crucial it is to know that when our emotions aren't being faithful, when they're not being trustworthy, when they're not being accurate, To know that our gracious God has never stopped being faithful. If I am weak, then I can be assured that he is strengthening me. If I am straying, then he's there seeking me out. If I am confused, then he's there with his word instructing me. If I'm feeling alone, isolated, or separated, then he, our loving and giving God, assures me that he's right there with me. Not according to wishful wishful thinking, I should say, but according to his own promise. Promises that he gives to each and every one of you and all of God's children. This is also why God gives us his word, the Bible, and the sacraments. So that we have visible and tangible tools to make use of when we maybe lose sight of God's amazing grace and mercy in our lives. And especially the promises of a saving God who never fails us, nor is his promise, nor to abandon us. And bonus... These words also point ahead to our real hope. When our guilt weighs us down, we might wonder whether we're truly ready to meet God or to stand before his judgment throne. Ever had thoughts or feelings like that? So understand what's happening here. God is strengthening us by means of his word and sacrament so that we remain solidly anchored in our saving faith and can still be fully confident that God considers us, you, me, to be blameless. Whoa, wait a minute, wait, wait. Let's think about that. The likes of you, the likes of me, blameless? No way. 
Well, actually, yes way. But blameless through our faith in Christ, not as a result of our own works. And through that faith in Christ, we are fully covered by the righteousness of Christ and by what he did for us. And if there's any more proof that's required, then all we need to do is meditate upon our Lord's death and resurrection. Because there at his cross, we see not only a truly innocent one. Remember, Pilate couldn't find a thing wrong, except he feared the crowds. So that innocent one condemned for the guilty, but also guilty ones like you and like me. Declared innocent forever. There we see not only the death of a sacrifice, but the return to life of a sacrifice through our risen and victorious servant. Normally when animals were sacrificed, they stayed dead. But Christ didn't. And there we see salvation complete. Sins completely forgiven, heaven restored, confirmed, and secured for you and for me and for everyone who believes in Jesus. So you see, dear people, it is absolutely true that God is faithful. And I get it that those three words may not sound that all exciting until you realize that those three words mean the difference between life and death, between the eternal flames of hell itself or an eternity in the glories of God's heaven. And see, here's the real truth. If God himself wasn't faithful, then every one of us would be doomed. But God is faithful, always And he stands behind each word, each syllable of his completed gospel message so that it can be our strength and our joy as we are all awaiting Christ to return, which he is coming. And that's the reason why we study these words on an Advent Sunday. Now, the people of Paul's day, well, they had just seen God's faithfulness as finally... The promised Savior had come, who was supernaturally conceived in the Virgin Mary, who went on to live a perfect earthly life in our place. And then he destroyed the power of death with his own death on Calvary's cross. And finally, gave ample proof of his glorious victory through his own bodily resurrection. So here we are, you and me, centuries later. And we're still waiting for Christ's second and final coming where the blessings of heaven and eternal life are delivered to us by Christ himself. But we don't wait as one who has no hope. We trust God in his word. And God would have you and me apply this same principle to our own waiting. Remembering that God is always faithful. And so we pray that God would bless each of us in such a way that the way we live our earthly lives clearly clearly reflects that thankfulness and that eager expectation. We know we're sinners, but we also know that God is faithful. Of that, there is no doubt. He has been faithful to his past promises by blessing us with full forgiveness through the work of the Christ child. And he's been faithful to his present promises by strengthening us through word and sacrament while we wait. And he will be just as faithful to his final promises, which is why we do keep watch. Remaining on guard and alert, knowing that he is our sure hope with the absolute certainty that he will one day bring us to our heavenly home. And there, 
be with the Lord forever. See, dear ones, there's our hope. There's our joy and our utmost confidence. Amen. Please rise for the blessing. And now may the peace of God which transcends our hope, our excuse me, our minds, our human understanding. I can't think straight here. But it transcends all of that in order to keep your hearts and your minds firmly planted in the risen and the coming Christ. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we invite you to make your presence known through our worship participation cards uh, that you have there in the pew. If you're a member, you know, you only need to include uh, your name uh, unless there's something's changed, your address, emails, phone number, something like that, that Linda would uh, need to know about. Or if you have a prayer request that you'd like for me to be praying about during the week, you can include that on the card as well. If you're visiting with us today, we extend our hand of welcome to you. And um, if you'd like to know more about our ministry here, uh, just have that card filled out. Mark it appropriately and we'll get word about our gospel ministry at Gloria Day. Once you have the card filled out, then you can just place it in the offering plate at the end of the service. And so let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, whom you so graciously sent to earth and offered as the Lamb of sacrifice for our sins. And Holy Jesus, you are the true Son of God, and we thank you for demonstrating God's love for us by coming here as our brother to die for our sins on the cross. And as we return in spirit to Bethlehem stable, where you first appeared in human flesh, to be our Savior. Lend us your grace to rededicate ourselves in thoughts, words, and deeds to you. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for giving us the faith of John the Baptist, which believes and confesses that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the whole world. Give to our hearts true joy and peace in believing that truth. And dear Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in this season, when we are reminded so much of the precious gift of salvation, which your divine love has given to us, stir up in our hearts a deep sense of brotherly love and cause us to be concerned about the welfare of others. Give to each of us a spirit of generosity toward those who are in need. And Holy Trinity, bless us we, the lambs and the sheep under your care, with every needful blessing. Grant to us good health in this winter season and keep every kind of disease and illness from us. Watch over our children and our grandchildren and protect them from all harm and danger. Keep under your mercy and special care the elderly and those who are feeble. And give aid to the needy and bring comfort to those who are distressed. And when this winter weather becomes severe, we pray that you would keep us safe and warm and protect us at all times in our travels. Stand guard over our homes, our schools, our churches, and places of employment. Grant these and all other needful blessings to us according to your good pleasure. And now hear the prayers and the petitions that come from the hearts of your dear people. Lord, we want to lift up to you your servant, Herb Schultz, who was taken to the hospital this morning. We pray that you will bless the doctors and nurses and all those who are tending to his care, and especially as they examine his heart and we ask that you would give them the wisdom and the understanding as to exactly what should be done so that he can be relieved of this weakness and pain. We place him, Lord, into your hands and ask that your will be done. 
And we pray that if it is your will, that you would spare his life, enable him uh, through the doctor's care and through whatever they prescribed to be able to strengthen his body once again, to strengthen his heart and enable him to return to his normal activities. Bless Kathy as well and bless all of his family and, and friends who are concerned. And we know, Lord, that you have him graciously in your care. Let Herb know that as well through your blessing. And gracious God, forgive our many sins, for it is because of them that Christ had to come down among us and die. Have your word dwell in us richly in all wisdom and grant us continual growth in grace and in the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in our Savior's precious name. Amen. And now we pray together as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us now turn to page 76 as we continue with our service of Holy Communion and singing together the Sanctus. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Come now to the Lord's Supper. And now may His body and His blood strengthen and preserve you in the one true saving faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. So we join together in singing our hymn 325.
And now with believing hearts receive our Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant to you his peace. Well, very good. And thank you for worshiping with us here this morning. It's always our hope that you have been strengthened in your faith uh, through the proclamation of God's word, as well as the strength of his sacrament, and also that you find encouragement uh, on comfort in the fellowship of fellow believers. Thank you, uh, Nancy, for providing the music for our worship. We always appreciate that very much. By way of announcements, you can see there's a bunch of them there. And of course, everyone is invited to our fellowship hall following the service today for some refreshments and good conversation. Um, Linda put in there, our church recently uh, received a check from Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church there in Weston, Ohio. Unfortunately, it had um, uh, closed, I guess is the easiest way to say it. And... Uh, so they sold their building and their assets, and uh, they picked out a number of uh, congregations within our synod, and they wanted to distribute those funds. So it was just shy, wasn't it, of $10 million, I think? Just a little bit shy of that. But no, I'm teasing, but we're thankful for their uh, thinking of us and uh, helping us uh, with our uh, finances. Uh, today's the last day to bid on the... Uh, annual church auction, the items that are over there. So you want to check that out um, before you leave here today. Oh, and then there's uh, Harold. I don't know, he might have went back already, right? But Harold has his jars of, um, uh, thank you, horseradish. Brain's not working, only partly. But if you need your sinuses cleared up, have a, a spoonful of that but better if you just add it to your sandwich or whatever. But uh, they're back there in the back as well. And then, of course, all adults are invited to our White Elephant uh, party, the Christmas party that we'll be hosting here. It's the annual one in our fellowship hall. That's at 6 p.m. Uh, tonight. We always have a great time. So I hope as many of you as possible uh, can come to that because it's a lot of fun, a lot of laughter, and um, some, sometimes some pretty unique uh, white elephant gifts. I still have one that's in the garage, and I, I mercilessly, mercifully, did not include it in this year's white elephant. All right, Tuesday morning Bible class. We're still studying the Book of Revelation. That's uh, at ten o'clock. You're certainly welcome to come to that. We have our wise men and wise women's Bible study uh, on Thursday this week at nine a.m. Followed by some uh, church projects that they'll be uh, working on. Please note that the uh, new offering uh, envelopes have been placed in your bulletin. I'm sorry, well, I mean mailboxes. Okay. I hope I'm better by tonight so I can <laughs> play those games good. All right. There's a sign-up sheet also for those interested in purchasing one of our poinsettias that have beautified our sanctuary for the Christmas, Advent and Christmas season. Uh, also, the, uh, there's a note there in the, uh, in the box about a church meeting uh, that um, we still have to do, right? Um, and, but this meeting will be shorter than the last one. And I think the last one, was it three minutes, Rick, or something like that? Oh, was it six? All right. When you're having so much fun, it's hard to tell, you know. Right, that's what I was just going to say. It's uh, next Sunday where there'll be, and so it's just basically an affirmation uh, vote that uh, we pay off one of our loans. We have a couple of them there, and it's going to pay the smaller one. And then when we pay that loan off, we'll be paying the, the account that that comes out of back periodically, so we're not having to pay uh, interest. Smart, huh? Okay. And let's see, are there any other announcements that need to be made? Uh, oh, the Dayspring Academy is also uh, collecting uh, toys and gift cards or money for their uh, um, Hero Foundation, the Nicholas, is it Koenig? Koenig? 
Koenig. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know exactly how to pronounce his name. But anyway, they're collecting these things for that uh, foundation. So if you can help out with that, I know that they would appreciate it. Any other announcements, Linda, besides the birthdays? And Okay, so it says it's in the bulletin, but you can't find it anywhere is what you're saying. Okay, so it didn't get put in this one, but there are uh, um, details about uh, the party tonight and the gifts and things like that. Did you have anything, Mary, about that? Okay, um, so as is our tradition, but we're actually a, a slightly late, just slightly, right, um, in our uh, birthdays and anniversaries. But uh, we do want to recognize Tim and Nancy. Uh, you have an anniversary coming up. Mike and Linda, Brian and uh, Carrie Bechtold, and Mary and Randy Stensrud. Congratulations to all of you. And then for our birthdays, uh, we mercilessly... I thought we did. I... Yeah, my wife knows. I woke up at about 12.30. I could not get back to sleep till later this morning. But anyway, I thought that too, but I didn't get a chance to ask you, am I losing my mind? I thought last week we did birthdays. But I am losing my mind, and yes, we did do this last week. All right. Well, very good. Well, happy birthday to all of you again. All right. And uh, did you have something, Keith? Oh, I'm an usher for an Oh. <laughs> You don't have anything to say? <laughs> All right. Well, well, that's right. We could mention that. Uh, we do have the new furnace. Uh, Keith, I don't know if you want to say anything about it. It puts out heat, doesn't it? Yeah, cooling. And cooling. It's all done? Yeah. So, very good. And we thank everybody for that. And thank you, Keith, for lining that up. And, and um, yeah, well, and, and also... I was going to try to say thank your dad, too, because he hassled the workers who were here. Yeah, yeah. My son is the one who... <laughs> yeah, anyway, God's blessings.